If you just want to see an animated Edgar Allan Poe, you can jump to the timecode on your screen. But if you first want to learn a little bit about Poe and his life, you can join me for a quick visit to the Poe Museum in Richmond, Virginia. It's housed in the oldest house still standing in Richmond. Poe would have known this house during his life, but he didn't live here. The museum consists of a few buildings around a small courtyard, each focusing on a different area of Poe's life and career. And appropriately, there was a black cat wandering around the premises. First up is the old stone house where we get to learn about his birth and his early life. Born in 1809, Edgar Allan Poe's life began with much strife, which undoubtedly influenced a lot of his work. His father abandoned the family when Poe wasn't even a year old, and Poe's mother died, possibly from pneumonia or tuberculosis, when he was just shy of his third birthday. This left a young Edgar effectively orphaned. <sighs> there is a skeleton sitting right there in the dark. Oh my god. <laughs> Poe was taken in by John and Francis Allen, and though he was never officially adopted, he incorporated the name Allen into his own, hence Edgar Allan Poe. Contrary to what one might think, given the dour image we often associate with Poe, he was actually quite the athlete in his youth, described as an excellent runner, boxer, jumper, and swimmer. At the Poe Museum, you can see items from Poe's childhood, including the very bed he used to sleep in. This here says that one of his boyhood friends recalled that Poe's greatest fear was that he would awaken at night to find that someone was watching him from the darkness. Decades later, Poe wrote The Telltale Heart, in which a murderer silently watches an old man sleep in a darkened room, and that is the part of The Telltale Heart that scares me the most, is the idea that someone is creaking open the door and just staring in silently watching the man. When Poe was 20 years old, his foster mother passed away. Poe's relationship with his foster father had always been extremely strained, John Allen deeming Poe deeply ungrateful and wasteful of his talents. The two effectively parted ways after many years of contention between them. Poe's love life also had its ups and downs, I'll just talk about his two major loves. Sarah Elmira Royster was Poe's childhood sweetheart, and they became engaged when Poe was around 17 years old. However, Royster's parents opposed the union, and so the engagement was eventually broken off. Royster went on to marry someone else. In 1836, Poe married a young Virginia Clem, his cousin, who was just 13 years old. He was 27. They were together 11 years until her untimely death at age 24. Years later, Poe reconnected with Sarah Elmira Royster, now Shelton, his now-widowed former childhood sweetheart, and they became engaged once again. But Poe died before they could be wed. We'll talk more about that later. Poe showed a keenness for writing starting in his youth. The earliest surviving poem we have of him was written at age 15. Last night, with many cares and toils oppressed, weary I laid me on a couch to rest. Three years later, in 1827, his first book was published. All of his published works, during his lifetime that is, came about between 1827 and 1849, 1849 being the year of his death. Strangely, Poe's only commercial book success was a book about conchology or the study of mollusk shells in 1839. The poem Poe is most famous for today is also what he was most famous for during his lifetime. The Raven, when published in 1845, was a smashing success, gaining Poe international fame. Strangely enough, he made just $15 for the original publication. Financial troubles haunted Poe throughout his life. Many things haunted Poe. Intermittent issues with alcohol and the untimely deaths of many of those who Poe loved most in the world. His inner pain and turmoil can clearly be seen in his writing. I recommend visiting the Poe Museum to check out all of the Poe-related artifacts on display, of which there are many. They're all small components to a life lived, a man who contributed so much to English literature. Things that he used, touched, you can see his handwriting, photographs. I think I was most fascinated by the things on display known to be related to or having inspired his writing. 
like the candelabra under which he wrote the bells, or the pocket watch that ticked away in Poe's pocket as he wrote the telltale heart. In the final house of the museum, you learn about the end of Edgar Allan Poe's life. You can see clothing he actually wore, which is amazing to me. You can see his boot hooks, an engraved walking stick, a large trunk in which he kept almost all of his belongings. You can also see the last photograph ever taken of Poe. Finally, you come to Poe's death. To this day, the circumstances surrounding his death remain a mystery. On October 3rd, 1849, Edgar Allan Poe was found at a tavern slash voting center in Baltimore, Maryland, wearing ill-fitting clothes, unintelligible, and in a very bad state. He was brought to a hospital where he remained for a few days completely delirious, in and out of consciousness, and he died on October 7th, 1849. The official cause of death was listed as brain inflammation, but for modern scholars, that's not really saying much at all. It was 1849, after all. Countless theories have since been put forth as to the cause of Poe's death, and you can see them here. At one point, some of Poe's hair was actually analyzed for the presence of heavy metals in order to try and determine factors contributing to his death, but nothing was concretely determined. So unless some new evidence is uncovered at some point, his death will always remain a mystery. And while we can never bring him back to life, we can use modern tools indistinguishable from magic to animate him and imagine what it would have been like to sit across from him face to face. There are a number of really famous images of Edgar Allan Poe, so I'm working with a couple here, starting with this one. For me, the most difficult part about colorizing a black and white photo is getting the skin color right, because obviously no one's skin color is the same. There are different undertones, and you don't really think about it, but when it comes time to colorize a photo, you start to notice this person does not look real. So you have to start layering on different colors. And on the right, you can see here all of the different colors that go into making someone look real. This is the next image I'm working on of Poe, and for this one I actually found on Google an image of a guy just in similar lighting, and from that I created a color palette to try and make things go a little bit more easily, you know, taking from an actual color photo what someone's hair might look like in that lighting, or what their cheeks would look like, the, the mid-tones, the highlights, the shadows, etc. A lot of this is guesswork. I don't know what Poe really looked like. I don't know if he had a cool undertone to his skin, or a warm undertone, or how red his face was, etc. This is all guesswork. I'm just doing what I think looks best in the moment. And finally, this is the last image of Poe that I'm going to be working on. I used the same palette for this one that I did the previous image, and I just did my best to make him look real. And now, in order to animate these now colorized photos, I used My Heritage. This isn't sponsored or anything, it's just the major program that I know, so that's what I used, and here are the finished products. Tell me what you think below. What do you make of this? When it comes to stuff like this, we have to keep in mind that this is just a lot of guesswork on the part of the algorithm or whatever this internet magic is doing to animate these photos. So to test it, I put in a photo of me that looks like this, and you know what I look like based on the video or other videos you've seen of me, and putting it through this system, this is what this algorithm thinks I would look like in motion. As you can see, there's something a little off here. I think my eyes look 
way too close together? I don't know. It's some weird, bizarro clone, but that's just to show you that this isn't really capturing me. It's capturing a weird version of me. Even the dimensions of my face seem to be altered here. So now when you look at Poe, keep that in mind. It's just an algorithm's guess. You know, he may not have moved this way or blinked like that, or maybe his eyes were slightly different than you're seeing here, and maybe his smile moved in a slightly different way. So is this capturing him? We will never know, but it's better than nothing. And it really makes you think, and I feel like I'm so lucky to be living in a time where we can do stuff like this and, you know, bring us that much closer to from the past. Even if it's not 100% accurate, it's still amazing. Thanks for joining me. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.